This is Impact Healthcare, people and strategies that are disrupting the health benefits industry. And now, here's your host, healthcare benefits industry expert and the originator of the transparent health benefits movement, Lester Morales. Hey, Impact Healthcare crowd, I am excited. Uh, And for those of you that have never met or heard of Deb Alts, our business affectionately calls her Nurse Deb. So Nurse Deb, say hello to our Impact Healthcare crowd. And I want to know a couple of things. I want to know about you. I want to know about your great company. And I want to know about your why. What gets you up in the morning, fired up to do what you do? Absolutely. Well, hey, Impact crowd. Super delighted to be here. Lester, thanks for having me. Um, You all know I'm a nurse by background and training. I was born to be a nurse. I don't know what you woke up uh, one day and said, oh my God, that's it. But nursing is that for me. And I loved, loved, loved being at the bedside, you know, and taking care of people. Um, All of that unfortunately changed one night for me working in the ICU. um, And to make a long story short, essentially, uh, we took a patient that we should not have taken in the ICU. Facility was not equipped to deal with that kind of patient. Patient ended up dying. Um, I'll never forget saying to my nurse manager, why did this happen? It isn't supposed to go this way. We should have never had this patient. And her response to me was one of those bellwether moments. She said, do you know how much money this facility would have lost if we had not kept that patient? And it was over, right? Talk about having your entire world blown up in an instant. Um, And so I spent quite a few years kind of soul searching and trying to figure out what do I want to be when I grow up? Because what I had grown up thinking I wanted to be, this wasn't it, right? And so wound up in managed care, you know? It's one of those um, over a bottle of wine kind of stories, but on the money side going, maybe we can change it from this side. And so that's what I've spent the last 20 plus years doing, 19 of them with my own company, with a team of nurses and doctors just coming alongside patients, handholding them, saying, this is the best care. Here's what the gold standard of care looks like. Here are the places that you can get that care. Here are the top ranked, here are the top notch facilities and doctors to get that care from. And just one by one, handholding them through that process. Man, I I actually, I've heard your story a bunch. I've actually never heard that part of the story and like literally the arms on my on my arms are my the hair on my arms are standing up man um goodness so so you you follow this dream right you follow this hey I have to change healthcare uh and I want to just dive in and kind of paint the picture so you've got a team full of nurses you got a team full of doctors you got people what do you guys actually do to impact healthcare? Anything and everything we can possibly think of or that you guys bring to us. So it's kind of funny because when we founded the company, we did it built on this idea with a handful of self-funded employers who'd been self-funded since the 70s, right? They knew their health plans. They knew their population. They'd been with the big buka carriers forever. And I'd been trying to get them to join like an independent TPA kind of model. And I said to them, guys, what's the deal? You know, we speak the same language. We are at all the same conferences. Why have you never done this, right? You tell me it's a good idea. Why haven't you done it? And every single one of them gave me some version of the same answer. It essentially was nobody gets fired for hiring IBM, right? They said, you come in here with product red, white, or blue, and you want us to shoehorn our plan into the closest fit. And we're not going to do that if it's with a no name, right? And so I said, well, what if I build a product that's specific to you? What if I built Fuchsia or Magenta because that's what you wanted? Is that something you would do? And fortunately for us, a handful of them said yes. Now, pretty quickly, we learned that a nurse can keep track of five or six groups and their nuances and their culture and their specialty. 
but there was no software to support that. That was not scalable, right? So we had to build all of that infrastructure to actually support that. And we've learned a ton and we continue to build as we go. So we were one of the first companies in the country to really embrace quality and cost-based transparency tools right way back in their infancy and people were like well you know this information it's not 100% valid well 25% is better than zero <laughs> right so it, we've been moving this direction over the last 20 years to where now it really is honed in and it works like free healthcare for all it already exists it is completely affordable for employers to do it now we just need more of them to start doing it I, I wanted to hone in, I even wrote on my pad the word it. So you've said that a couple of times. Let's, for the audience that maybe, you know, doesn't have the history between you and I that we know, what is it? So if we'd had to define it, what does it mean? So imagine if every person who was going to use the health plan had somebody to come alongside them, albeit telephonically, right? A trusted medical professional, you know, nurses are the most trusted profession on the planet, what, 19 years now, right? Who had no vested interest in anything except that person being as healthy as possible, as quickly as possible. An independent outside entity whose sole mission was, how do we get you the best care, the gold standard of care? Evidence-based medicine has been around for 26 years in a published form, right? How do we get you that knowledge about what the gold standard of care looks like, feels like, smells like? How do we access these 40-some different quality and cost transparency tools to help you figure out for your condition Where's the best place to go and get this particular procedure or service? Who's the best doctor at treating this specific type of disease or this specific disease, right? So I had a patient um, send me a message a couple of days ago and he said, I've got an epigastric hernia. Who should I go to? Well, a lot of people will go hernia, general surgeon, right? But an epigastric is a fairly rare type of hernia and a really kind of tricky location. You want to go to somebody who specializes in those. You don't want to go to somebody who treats umbilical or inguinal hernias, right? There's a difference there. So bringing every single patient who's going to access the healthcare system and is going to get healthcare claims paid for by your plan, those resources, that support, that information, and giving them an ally and a partner and an advocate to walk through that recovery with them. I mean, it's as simple as where are you going to get your crutches from? Right? Are you going to let the hospital send you home with a pair of crutches from the physical therapy department for 250 bucks? Or are you going to go on Facebook and say, hey, anybody I know got a pair of crutches in their garage or basement? Right? Take those crutches with you and have the physical therapist size them up and they're free. So, I mean, it's simple stuff like that that patients just don't know. They don't think ahead, like they know they're getting their knee operated on, but who thinks about I'm going to need a pair of crutches, right? So, but that's what the nurses do. They come alongside them and get them all that support and information and guidance. So, well, first of all, I have to give shout outs to, to nurses. My mom worked for the VA for 41 years. And so I know how special nurses are and, and what a unique balance between, I want to give you a hug, but I also want to kick you in the rear end too. So uh, I, I can appreciate that. Um, so I, I, I love this conversation because Nowhere in your description of what it is, did you say, I need to worry about lowering the insurance costs, but we're going to talk about that being the absolute byproduct of this. We said that, and I'm going to make sure I narrow this down. You work with employers who right. offer health insurance to their employees. They want their employees to get the best quality care at the best place. They want them to have an advocate there because I don't know when your mom gets diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, like mine did. The last thing you're thinking about is, I don't know what you're thinking about, but you don't have anybody to call because Blue Cross doesn't tell me what I should do with my mother. So I want to get them to the best place. I want them to have a shepherd, a guide, a Yoda to get them through the healthcare system. And 
all of that is for the patient in order to have a better healthcare experience. I got that right. That's absolutely right. And the natural consequence of that is that everybody wins financially. So everybody wins. So let's let's touch this because you know we're we're gonna say so I got the highest quality health care. Right. So most would think, well, if I buy the BMW versus the Honda Accord, I pay more money. You're 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 stating that in healthcare, higher quality, lower, lower costs. Yeah, it makes no sense, right? No, Welcome to healthcare in America. It's the fee for service system right? If you take your car to the mechanic to get the wiper blades changed and they discover that you also need a headlight changed and, oh, you need new brake pads and your muffler's about to go bad, do they make more money or less? More. Same thing happens with your health care, right? So if you go in and you get okay care, but you don't recover as quickly, do they get paid more or less? Well, you keep going back the longer it takes you to recover, right? So they get paid more. So this fee-for-service system that we have in America, as our friend David would say, it's not broken. It works perfectly for the people who designed it. It's just that the patient and the employers who are paying for their health care are not the ones who designed it, right? So if we can get them the highest quality health care, it goes to follow. Healthier people file fewer claims, right? It, it, it just, it, it is how healthcare in America works. Highest quality is always lowest cost. So, and then I, I look at this because again, I come from a family, you know, dad, multiple myeloma, mom, pancreatic cancer. Unfortunately, they both passed away. So I've seen the experience of accessing healthcare. I've also felt the financial ruin of filing bankruptcy because of this. So this is so real to me. And I think of this that says, knowing what I know now, who says no to this, right? So like, I'm trying to think of this, like a patient gets told during an open enrollment meeting, let's say, you know, nobody loves talking about health insurance, but this isn't a conversation about health insurance. This is a conversation about health care. And that if you have any questions, you have a need, call the nurse. That's all you have to do. Just call the nurse. So, so walk me through now, I'm on the other side of the phone and I'm nurse Deb, I'm nurse Jeannie, I'm nurse Melissa, I'm nurse, all your nurses. Walk me through that side of the conversation because unless you've seen it, 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 it probably is foreign. So give me a, a setting, like what are they looking at? What's the conversation? Um, tell me about the types of nurses you have. Like they, they, they gotta love this. Every single one of our nurses has their own sentinel moment. They have their own healthcare horror story, you know? So they've all seen that side of it and they're here on purpose, right? They're here with a mission and a drive and a passion to fix this and to take care of these people. When a patient calls us, the very first thing that we do is ask them their name and their date of birth. We pull them up in our system and we can instantly see everything we need to know about them and their health plan, right? Their age, their gender. Is this a PPO plan or a reference-based pricing plan? Is it one that offers incentives for them to go to the highest quality providers or not? So all of that is instantly at our fingertips with nothing more than their name and date of birth, right? So that's really key, having those systems and processes built. The next thing that we always do is a very brief conversational triage. Right. So we want a patient who calls in to talk to a nurse to feel like they're talking to their long lost sorority sister. Right. So tell me what's going on. How long has it been going on? What have you done so far? And we use a triage protocol to help them decide, should I be making them call 911? Is going to the urgent care the right place? Can this wait till their doctor's office opens tomorrow? Right. What should they be watching for in the meantime? Like Lester, if this happens, call 911. Don't wait, right? What can they be doing for comfort measures, right? Most people know rest, ice, compress, and elevate. What if it's your low back, right? Do you maybe need heat instead of ice? So walking them through those comfort measures. And then the reason we use nurses is because you have to be able to make some clinical assumptions about what's next, right? So you're dealing with the immediate. Here's your immediate need. Here's the comfort measures. But 
when you go to your primary care doctor, he's going to want some x-rays. He's going to want some blood work. Under your plan, the best way for you to get those is, and talking them through, go to this facility for that, or utilize this bolt-on cost containment strategy, right? If your doctor's going to want an MRI and green imaging is in place, are you going to remember that when you're sitting at the doctor's office? Of course not, right? But if the nurse said, hey, he's probably going to want some imaging, remember, you've got this and it would be free if you went through this, or hey, most of the time, this ends up getting some surgical intervention, right? Here's the best surgeon. Here's the best place. So that clinical anticipation and helping you to do not only what's right clinically, but what's in your best interest as the way your plan is laid out. So marrying together that clinical and financial, that's the key component that makes us different from everybody else in the world. So Man, I, I just love this conversation. So best, let's go with this word best because I have heard you speak and I love the question about art and science and, 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 and how that works. So walk me through that whole mindset of best. Because again, as a patient, I've had my ACL, MCL, PCL repair. I've had my you know eyes operated, my tonsils. I mean, I've, I've experienced some healthcare myself. I don't ever think anybody says, you know what, can I go to the second or third place person? So I think this word best is such a great word that we don't think about, but walk me through that definition of best and, and how do we come up with that? There are really three best that a patient has to care about. The first one, probably most important one is what is the best care, right? So medical knowledge doubles every 70 some days. It's amazing, right? Imagine if your job changed every two and a half months, there is no way you'd be able to stay on top of it. So asking doctors and hospitals and facilities to stay on top of evidence-based medicine and to be completely aware of it all the time is asking them to do the impossible, right? Evidence-based medicine guidelines are published though, but it costs a boatload of money to license them. So no patient's ever going to be able to Google, you know, what is the best treatment for, you know, ACL repair, right? They're not going to be able to do that. We bring that to the table for them. So the first best they have to worry about is what is the best care? What does the evidence-based medicine show us? What are the double-blind randomized clinical controlled study trials indicating is most likely to get me to the best recovery possible, right? That's the very first thing they have to care about. The second place they have to worry about is who is the best provider to deliver that care, the best facility, the best physician. And it amazes me sometimes how people make those decisions. It's usually their next door neighbor's best friend's cousin's nephew who said, I went to him and he was all right. It has nothing to do with objective quality scores like readmission rates or morbidity or infection or you know any of the things that clinically matter. I literally, when I am vetting a quality and cost transparency tool, there's this particular surgeon that I happen to know who was one of the creators of the procedure where they get into the deepest recesses of the brain by going through the nose. This guy is a genius, right? Created the procedure. He also happens to be a little bit of an asshole. Okay, most neurosurgeons have pretty good egos, not such great bedside manner. I always ask them to look up that particular physician and tell me what his quality score is. I had one of those tools tell me that that physician got a very low quality score. And when we dug into why he got that low quality score, one of the comments they were relying on was that the wallpaper in his waiting room looked like it was from the 70s. <laughs> right? Who cares about that? Did you die? Did you get right. an infection? Right? So. Patients will make decisions on what care to get from non-objective sources. And that's really a problem. You should be looking at objective, measurable, clinical outcomes. So best place, best doctor, you got to be careful where you're, you're picking that. And then the third best that patients have to worry about is what is the best way to get this care without going bankrupt in the process, right? That whole purchasing side of it, that shopping and consumerism side of it. So this translates, in my opinion, which is really interesting because 
What drives me crazy about our business is that we insulate employees from all the things that they do in their entire lives, right? It's like, oh, my employees won't understand this, but those are the same people that cut coupons. And so if all you told them was, which I want to get into this conversation about incentives, right? Because the reality of this is parents have been incentivizing kids from the beginning of time. Do this, make your bed, you get your allowance, right? Reality of employers need to treat their employees like children, but give them the tools to act like adults. And so I think about this because I buy a car. I know exactly how much my Jeep Cherokee would have cost at that dealer, that dealer, that dealer. And if I would have gotten it from over there and I would have been willing to drive three hours in that direction to save $5,000, but when I went to go get my knee surgery 10 years ago, as an insurance advisor, <laughs> I had a $6,500 deductible. Funny that you said they asked their buddy. That's exactly what I did. Hey, who had knee surgery? I go to this person. He tells me to do X, Y, and Z. I do X, Y, and Z. I pay $6,500. The plan still ends up paying $60,000. And the reality of it is we know that you can get a knee surgery for a $20,000 bundle all day long. Every so day. walk me through now the plan. So now I'm an employer. I've hired you. Uh, we put together this program. What does this program look like for my employees and their families? So it depends on how far along the continuum you're willing to go right? Are you going to rip the bandaid off and go the whole way and just jump in and do it? Or are you taking baby steps? Are you inching the bandaid off a little at a time, right? So each group has to understand where they're at. So I talk about what is your PEPY and where do you want it to be? How much noise are you willing to do, um, endure? How much communication campaign do you already have? What's your rapport and your relationship with your employees already, right? We've had groups make complete turnarounds, right? My employees hate me. They think I'm an ogre to they think I'm Santa Claus because they've ripped the mandate off and gone the whole way, right? They've let's, said, let's talk about that whole way. So let's, uh, let's assume that if an employer is listening or an advisor is listening, they're all the way in. They want to impact healthcare. Let's assume that it's that. Yep. So there's a really simple way to think about it. If the patient calls the nurse first and they follow the nurse's recommendations and advice on what care to get, when to get it, where to go to get it, that care becomes free for the patient. Their copay and deductible are waived. If they call the nurse and they say, mm, not going to do that, I want to do what I want to do, right? They're still adults. They still have free will. They still have the choice to make bad decisions. Then their regular deductible and copay apply just like their Blue Cross plan from last year. Right. So, so in that example, this is what I call all carrot, no stick. Right. I had the opportunity to call or not call. I had the opportunity to go left or right. I decided not to go left, although they told me to go left. I pay the same thing that I did last year. Right. But if I was willing to pick up the call one time and PS, talk to somebody who actually has data that says this person's good, that person sucks. And all of that resulted into, you should probably go to the person that's good. And all that resulted into free for me, the patient. That's all carrot, no stick. That's right. And by the way, if you're the employer, that costs about a third of the national average claims cost today. So you're going to come in at between five and 6,000 PEPY when you're running probably 12 to 18,000 PEPY right now. So in case any of our audience PEPY is per employee per year, we get in the jargon in our business. So, so I'm going to reiterate for everybody that's listening because you should have popcorn right now. And at this point, you're bizarre waiting for this grand finale. You also save money. So let me, let me reiterate this. You get your employee to the highest quality possible healthcare. Right. You, that employee gets free healthcare and you can save a third of your second largest 
P and L expense item, which is typically healthcare. So I have to ask the question then, because this is what I ask myself every day I get up. Why? Why doesn't anybody say absolutely hell yes? I'm in. Where do I sign up? Jump in the middle of the pool. What's the downside to this? Well, number one, understand that not every employer has been exposed to this, right? The big alphabet houses are not incentivized to bring these kind of revolutionary programs to the foreground. Which is why we're doing this podcast. Yep. So that's challenge number one. So everybody who's on this podcast, understand you do not have a ton of competition in presenting these ideas and solutions. And and the alphabet soups of the house are not going to come out and, and present this, right? So use that to your favor. The downside for an employer is that there will be some noise because yes, when members opt in, they love it, but guess what? Lester, if your doctor had called to do the pre-certification rather than you calling and he wasn't the best doctor or he wasn't taking you to the best place, I would have said, time out, I have to talk to Lester. And then I would have called you And you would have been like, who the hell is this woman? And why is she calling me? And why does she have her nose in my business? And why is she telling me to go somewhere other than where my doctor has told me to go to? So if you haven't been very well prepped by your employer that, hey, we've got this great new benefit and this option exists and you might get a call from the nurse and she's just trying to help you, there can be noise involved with that. So groups that want zero noise, that just want every claim paid, no questions asked, and don't ever want their members or their patients to have to have any kind of responsibility or interaction or communication or work around healthcare, this model won't work for them. You know, it's interesting. I I think about that. And again, having accessed healthcare myself, having had parents that have had this issue, I think about that word work, right? And and what that really means. And at the end of the day, not doing the work is also work. You know, I I call that when I talk to employers, the cost of inaction, hey, not making a decision is also going to cost you something. In this scenario, work on behalf of a patient is jumping into the abyss. I have no idea the quality scores. I have no idea how much they're going to charge me. They're not going to tell me how much they're going to charge me until weeks after. And at that point, I can't do anything about it. You can't impact something that has already happened. Right. And in this scenario, the work is talking to somebody who has my best interest in mind, has all the data, black and white, to be able to prove this. And at the end of the day, I, the patient, eat the biggest carrot. Man. Give me that work all day long. Well, and we're going to be talking in January at Ascend and in February at David's event and coming out in the book that we're helping to author um, here at the end of this year about those scenarios where the patients don't put in that work. And unfortunately, a lot of those patients, they die, they have horrible clinical outcomes right? So there is a a cost of inaction. There is a consequence to the decisions that patients make, and it ends up hurting them and their families and their pocketbook and their employer and their coworkers. So there is a downside to this. Healthcare as it is today is not sustainable. It's just not. So unless we want to live in that world, we have to do something to fix it. I love it. I love it. So Let's, uh, let's wrap up. I, I want to re- I want to leave this with a feel good, you know, story. I, I am sure having, you know, known and, and, and see how these programs work, flowers get delivered to the office. Oh my God. You know, all the things that never get. So give me that story, uh, that you always remember that like, you know, is, is that special part in your heart? Uh, and tell me, tell me what happened. Like, uh, the patient, the employer, like, tell me that whole story, just so that I'm pay- that an employer who's listening to this, an advisor who's listening to this, shoot, a patient who's listening to this gets an idea of how this works, but but really works. Oh my gosh, there are so many of those, Lester. I think one that really really sticks out in my mind is Latanya. She actually threw a party where she served kidney beans. Now let me tell you why. I know that's a weird thing to serve at a party, but. 
she came to us, her stop loss carrier actually asked us to intervene and work with her. And she was in kidney failure and she needed a transplant. And we were able to get her multi-site listed. Now, the first place that she had gone to at her doctor's recommendation put her on a waiting list and told her to expect it to be at least three years before she got a phone call about a potential transplant, right? We're like, no way, that cannot happen. So we got our multi-facility listed. We talked to the National Alliance of Paired Kidney Donation. We pulled all the strings and did all the things from a navigation standpoint that could be done to get her transplanted as quickly as was humanly possible. In just shy of one year, she got her kidney transplant, was completely off of dialysis, wasn't having to take all of the medications and deal with all the dietary restrictions and everything that she'd been having to deal with. And so she invited us all to her transplant success party, and she served kidney beans in honor of her new kidney. But there's no reason that she would have needed to live on dialysis for three years. It, it was just unheard of right? But just stepping in and saying, we can help you. There's a lot of solutions to this. And oh, by the way, her employer saved about a quarter of a million dollars between the bundled surgical price for the transplant, getting her off of dialysis sooner, getting her back to work full-time. She was missing three half days a week to go to get dialysis from work, right? I mean, there's just, there's no way you can actually put a value on it I, 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 you know, and, and, and just to think again, on the other side of that, she is a better mom, a better grandmother, a better, you know, sister, brother. Well, I mean, you know, you, you think about this and sometimes we catch ourselves in our business, looking at claims information and getting very analytical and black and white. And we forget that at the end of the day, and I know this drives you and it drives me at the end of the day, we are serving a human, a body, a person. And if we just focus on that person, which is exactly what you and AIM do every day, that one person, do a good job for that person, get them to the right spot, everything else from cost to productivity to just having somebody be a better mom. I just, I mean, it fires me up. Like I want to like, I'm at the end of my day now. I want to just start a whole new day at work and, and, and start this. So Nurse Deb, for anybody that wants to see more, hear more, uh, you know, get in contact with you, how, how, do we, how do we let them know that? Probably the easiest way is just to go to our website, which is A-I-M, like Mary, dash, like the minus sign, M, like Mary.com, A-I-M-M.com. Awesome. And uh, your your book and everything will be uh, coming out next, uh, you know, the end of this year and the early part of next year. Yep. And uh, if you haven't seen her too, you follow her on LinkedIn. What is your LinkedIn, uh, whatever they call it, the name? Uh, I think it's <laughs> Deborah Alt. Okay, Deborah <laughs> Alt. Her, when, when she's in trouble, her mom called her Deborah. So uh, Deborah <laughs> Alt. So Nurse Deb, that's what you're known to, to all of us. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I, I just thank you for starting your business. Start, thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for educating people like me and, and the rest of the people out there to, to understand that, that doing something different, although not hiring IBM in that example, is actually a way better difference. And it's making a difference. And making a, which would title this, impact. So thank you for helping us impact healthcare. For, for anybody that wants to follow us more, please visit impacthealthcare.fm. And if you want to get notified when we drop a new episode and uh, want to get the collateral from these episodes, please text us and be part of our text community. Uh, text us at 813-537-6992. Nurse Deb, thank you so, so much. Impact Healthcare Crowd, we will see you on the next uh, episode and uh, everybody have a good day. You've been listening to Impact Healthcare, people and strategies that are disrupting the health benefits industry with Lester Morales. Remember, the journey to getting 20% savings on your healthcare benefits starts with total transparency. 
Visit impacthealthcare.fm backslash journey to access leading industry case studies, compelling member stories, and to check out all of our podcast episodes. That's impacthealthcare.fm backslash journey. Remember to subscribe to the Impact Healthcare podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts.